of God. Welcome to Gospel Revolution Church. Welcome to everybody watching online. It's good to be here with you guys. I wasn't expecting to be here, but hallelujah, I'm here, and it's awesome to be with you and to see all you guys. To everybody in Tulsa, thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you so much for, for loving on me and welcoming me into your homes and sharing a meal with me. I'm sorry that I left unexpectedly, but I love you guys, and I can't wait to see you again. Um, I hadn't uploaded all the messages yet, but I will upload them onto the YouTube channel. The first one is up. Um, it's about communion and what it means to actually discern the Lord's body. Uh, and you might go listen to it. You might not have thought of communion like that. It'll really bless you. Bless me. And then the next one that I'll upload is about the perfection of the Father. And then I teach the Beatitudes from the perspective of Jesus um, calling forth heaven into the earth by declaring the perfection of the Father. And uh, it's really good. So when I get those things up, um, we'll post them and you can go listen to them and you can like be in the living room there with us all, you know, so it, it was really good. Um, man, we just want to remember all the families that, that lost someone on, on 9-11, you know, um, in the, the Twin Towers. And we know that the death has lost its sting. We know that Jesus abolished the power of death when he came out of the grave, free from sin and death, never to be able to die again. Uh, but that does not make us indifferent to the, the hurt that people can feel in this world. And so we just want to keep the families of people that lost loved ones um, in 9-11 or any of the things associated with that. Um, because understanding the gospel, man, we understand the way the death in the world tries to war on people. And so we just, uh, man, keep them in your prayers if you think about it. The men's Bible study, do you, are we having it? Yeah. We'll have the men's Bible study tomorrow, guys, so 8 o'clock. Come hang out. Wednesday night, um, we're not sure if we're going to have the, the group yet. Looks like Jay's having a procedure on Tuesday. And so we'll kind of play it by ear and see what happens. And I'll let everybody know. Everybody online, I'll let you guys know too. Um, and then next Sunday, we'll get back to the regular schedule. We'll have Bible study from 9 to 10. And then the normal service after. Uh, if anybody uh, is feeling in their heart, they want to make a donation to the, the ministry, you could do it at gospelrevolutionchurch.com. The baskets are around the room. You can follow a link on the, the YouTube uh, live stream if you feel that you want to make a donation. And we thank you so much for your support of the gospel, your support of us, and your support uh, of us, man, preaching the word and just getting the word out. We couldn't do it without all of your, your generosity and your love for the gospel. I think that's the thing that touches me the most, people's love for the gospel, you know. Um, and it, you have a part in the word going forth. It's a co-laboring with God. Well, you're not really doing the laboring, but you're talking of his labor, right? And that, that's why it's called co-labor. It's not because he's laboring and then you're laboring too. It's that you're partaking with him in the labor he's done by declaring it, right? And it's kind of like this beautiful thing. Behold the work of God. And so thank all you guys that help us declare the work of God in this earth. We're so thankful um, for you. And man, without wasting any more time. We got a treat today. Mr. Maurice Cabarack is going to be teaching us from the, the whiteboard, and it's going to be awesome. Maurice, you want to come up? Okay. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. How's everybody doing? Uh, talk about the gospel. If people understood the simplicity of the gospel, their lives would be like utterly transformed because the gospel is like ridiculously simple but uh it, as simple as it is it's deep and as simple as it is our minds can be distracted from the truth of the gospel i was i was just sharing a minute ago with someone that uh that's all you have to do is like get on your cell phone get in facebook and hit the news feed and flip through the news feed and start reading. And you can be as happy as a lark. <laughs> happy as a lark. And in about a minute and a half, you can be completely depressed. <laughs> not because the news is so bad. And not because, uh, you know, of anything that is actually happening to you at all. It's just what you're reading can affect your mind in such a way that 
you find yourself like the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. And you start feeling like the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket. And you know where it's going to hell? In your mind. And uh, with that in mind, I just wanted to kind of introduce what I wanted to uh, talk about today. Uh, Y'all know I took psychology in school. No. You know, undergraduate degree in psychology. And, you know, like uh, a real good job interview might get you a job as a, uh, in Walmart somewhere, you know, <laughs> if you have a good job interview. But, uh, but I learned some things. I learned some things about uh, the fathers of modern day psychology. And one of those guys was a guy named uh, Abraham Maslow. And he had certain psychological thoughts and ideas that became like theories that, psychological theories that you find in psychology books today. And one of those things was Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And that's what we're looking at here, right here. Y'all take a look at it while I'm, while I'm talking here. But uh, Maslow, I want to talk about Maslow. Maslow was kind of like me. Because Maslow was a guy who, like, cared about people, was curious as to why people behave like they do. What is it that drives mankind's lives? How do you consider and look at how mankind uh operates in the world in which he lives and how is that done effectively and when it's not being effectively done like if there's something amiss in a person's life why is it that that thing has gone amiss why is this person struggling in life so he came up with this uh psychological theory he called it his hierarchy of needs. Now, today, we call it Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But he called it the hierarchy of needs. And what, he, what, he, what his basic premise was this, that as we proceed forth through life, mankind has these needs. And some of those needs, when you're young, are very base. Things like all your physiological needs, air and water, shelter, sleep, clothing, all of, all of that uh, it is something that is provided to you by your parents and you begin to function and go from uh, pablum to, to eating steak you know, at some point. And uh, beyond that, you start looking at these somewhat more higher uh, needs like the need for safety, like personal security, employment, resources, health, attaining property, things like that. Then you move on to even higher needs, like love and belonging, that's friendship and family, intimacy, a sense of connection with the people around you. Then from there, you move on to like your career life and your need to feel like uh, you're respected, that you have self-esteem and uh, you know that you have a strength or freedom that that tells you that I have worth and value. Then he comes to this, uh, this, this last uh, you know, state of being, and that is a state of being self-actualized, or to become the most that you can possibly be. Now, what he says, what Maslow says, is that we go through these stages of life and so there's some intermingling that takes place, but we go through these stages. And if there is something traumatic that happens to us during one of these particular stages, it will affect us, and keep us from being effective or, or moving smoothly into one of these other stages. And uh, I got to tell you, I think that was pretty thoughtfully considered by him. Don't y'all think so? Yeah. By the way, please interact with me. If anybody got anything to say, feel free to share. Okay. Uh, 
he, he thought of this stuff and considered it. And in reality, we do have needs, don't we? Don't we? Absolutely. So the question then becomes, Maslow was just this guy. He was a psychologist. And he came up with these uh, thoughts about how man operates. And he presented them to the world. And now we have Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But God has a way or a wisdom about him in regard to how man works through, works through this life and actually has a life in the earth. And he has a certain wisdom in him. So I'm going to look at what the difference between the wisdom of men is and what the, what the wisdom of God is. Now, hang on for one second. Now, my, my little triangle is not as good as Maslow's. So, all right. So, y'all can digest that for a second. So, there are parallel. How to say this? The things that Maslow realized is a, a is things that a lot of people have realized. He just put it down on paper and pencil. But there are certain truths about humanity that have truth in it. But there's a that and that's the wisdom of man. Okay, but God has a wisdom inside of Himself that parallels that which is found in man. But it is higher than that which is in man. And I'd like to show you today, I want to look at the distinctions between the way man views certain things and the way God views things. It's like Maslow's theory of, uh, you know, his hierarchy of needs. You know, there are a lot of Freud had theories. All of the great psychologists had theories about man, his behavior, why he does what he does. But they are just that. Theo <laughs> you know what the difference between a theory and a fact is? Somebody got to know what the in difference is. There's, <laughs> there's no difference, but in fact, there is. Like the difference between theory and practice, in theory, there's no difference, but in practice, there is. Well, what, 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 what a theory is, in essence, is this. A theory is an idea or a concept that you come up with that may be true and it may not be true. That's what a theory is. It, it may be true and it may not be true. Now, there are theories that mankind has come up with that have proven true and they are no longer a theory. They're actually a fact. We know that this is 100% true because when it's studied, it is determined to happen every time the same way. So when, when, a, when a theory or an idea becomes 100% provable, it becomes a fact. And that's kind of like with theologies. You see, there, there's this parallel that exists. In theologies, man comes up with all kinds of ideas and thoughts about God, who he is, how he operates, how he correlates with man. And some of those things are true, and some are not true, and some have elements of truth. But the difference between a theory, a, a theology, and a truth is that a truth, as long as you're a person who believes in the scriptures, that is, a truth is 100% provable. So when something is true, someone would have to be able to take their theology and go through the scriptures and share that with you. And any reasonable-minded 
person who has the Spirit of God living in them would have to look at those truths, at these ideas that you came up with, and say, you know, I can't deny that being true. There's no way, when you, when you see the evidence there, that that can possibly not be true. An example of that is Jesus died on a cross. Now, if you believe the scriptures, now, if, if a person does not know the Lord and he just doesn't believe Jesus, well, he can say, you, you're not, you never proved anything to me. That's possible. But a person who believes the scriptures, that the scriptures came to us through the prophets in the Old Testament, through the apostles in the New Testament, and what they communicated to us was true. When the scriptures say something very simple, like Jesus died on a cross, there's no way you can refute that because the scriptures clearly say he died on a cross. Now, it can become much more uh, deep, much deeper than that. But there are a lot of theologies that prove true and are actually true. Things like the Trinity. Listen, God is one God made up of three distinct entities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I can prove that to you true through the scriptures. If, you, if, if, if somebody didn't understand that and wanted to uh, consider that with me and look through the scriptures with me, I could prove that true. The fact that the Trinity is, is, exists and it is real, that is true. Now, so as we look at these things, as we go through, you know that we have these corresponding things like for, for mankind, everything is intellectual. With God, everything is spiritual. With, with man, everything is temporal. With God, everything is eternal. With man, we are continually striving toward fulfillment. And listen, that seems, in, in the world, that seems perfectly plausible, natural, and as it should be. We're all trying to get better. With God, he's no longer, with God, we are no longer striving for fulfillment, but we have been fully satisfied. With man, life ends with death. You all know anybody that hasn't died yet? But with God, you never die. With, with man, the need for love never gets fully satisfied. Although someone might argue about that. They may have had good love experiences in this life. But in general, with humanity, love is never satisfied. With God, love is fully realized. So this is what we're kind of looking at. And, and, and how does this all come to be? We're just kind of look, looking at this thing. We're going to look at each one of these things in detail through the scriptures. But what, I, what I'd like to show you is, is how a man departs from the realm of a purely carnal existence evaluating things by their theories, their facts, their intellect, all these temporal ideas and concepts into a belief system which brings to you truth and spirituality and etern eternal life, a fully satisfying life, a life that never ends, and a life that is completely compassed about by the love of God. A, a light by which, you know, speaking of love, let me just, I wanted to say one thing. I was thinking the other day, you know, if mankind just loved one another, it would solve a lot of problems. Would it? I mean, I'm going to tell you, from the carnal perspective, that's a preposterous thought. Because we know in human history, there's a lot of people that didn't love one another. So if, if that being the case, how can love be the answer? Right? If mankind 
is incapable of really loving one another, how can love be the answer for mankind? But just think about this. Think about Vladimir Putin right now. If Vladimir Putin loved the Ukrainians, if that's all he wanted to do was bless the Ukrainians and do good to them and to trade with them and have good relations, and instead of dropping bombs on him, he flew over and dropped roses down on him and said, listen, I want to be your friend. Let's be friends together. Just think about how many people would not have died, all the destruction that has taken place. Just think about that. Why don't he just love the Ukrainians? Wouldn't things be better if Vladimir Putin just loved the Ukrainians? Why don't he just do that? Because God knows that, that, that the love that is contained in God is not found in humanity. His love is not found in humanity. And we're going to look at how, how this actually transposes from Point A to point B. Turn me, turn with me if you would to uh, John chapter six. John chapter six, verse twenty-eight. So. Jesus is with the uh, Jesus is with the uh, a group of people, not the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, just regular people, and uh, he has this interaction with them, and they inquired of him, "What must we do to perform the works of God?" And Jesus replied, "The work of God is this." To believe on the one he sent. So they asked him, what sign will you give us so that we can see and believe you? What will you do? Now we're going to continue that. But I, you know, we mentioned truths and what is true. So they asked him, what work of God, what must we do to do the works of God? And what does, he, what does he say to them? Believe on the one he sent. So, that is what I would call a truth. That's not a theory. That is not a this plus this, and you'll get to where you need to be. When he says, believe, on the one he sent. That is what it, it takes to do the do works God desires for you to do. That's a truth. So what, what does that lead you to, to think? That's all that we need to do. Believe on the one he sent. So we move on from there. And he's in this, this uh, he says this. Well, this is what uh, the people said. They said, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus answered, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who came down from heaven and gives life to the world. And listen to this precious response from the people. They say, sir, give us this bread at all times. Isn't that a, just a, a, actually a beautiful response? But he knew that they didn't know what he was actually talking about. They actually thought that he was talking about a physical bread. <laughs> but they recognized that there was something about this guy that was believable. And when they heard him speak, he was speaking with authority. So 
This is the difference between a theology and a truth. When Jesus says the work of God is to believe on him, that is the work of God. And the reason I say that is that in your theological studies, in your Bible reading, it's important to come to realize that that is the work of God. You know why? Because there's a lot of works of God that are talked about, talked about through the scriptures. And when somebody speaks of work, that is what he's, when Jesus and God speaks of work, that is what he's talking about. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. You do that, you're doing the work of God. You walk, live, move, you have your being in God, you will find yourself understanding that the work of God is to believe on the Son. Yeah. That's what we're that that is our obligation to believe on the Son. Now we move on to it intellectualism and 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 being spiritual. Listen to this. So this is a. Uh, Jesus again. This is from John chapter 10. If y'all want to go over there. John chapter 10, verse 24. So the Jews gathered around him and demanded, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So he says to them, I told you already, but you did not believe. The work I do in my Father's name testify on my behalf but because you are not my sheep you refuse to listen or to believe my sheep hear my voice I know them and they follow me I give them eternal life and they will never perish no one can snatch them out of my hand my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of my hand I and the father or one. At this, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. So, I'm going to tell you what's spiritual. Understanding that Jesus, this Jesus who said the work of God is to believe on him, has given us eternal life. And that life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have the life. But if you got the life, you have everything you need because the work of God is fully sufficient to have provided that life for you. As this little thing says, that he is he's the bread that came down from heaven that man might have life. And how did that life come? He died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Was buried. Three days later, he rose again. And he gave gifts to man. We're going to talk about those gifts. All right. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35. Paul writes this. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised and what kind of body will come? And, he, and, and Paul tells him, are you so foolish? What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that will be, but just the seed. Perhaps wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he designed. To each kind of seed, he gives its own body. Now all flesh is the same. It's not all flesh is the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals another, birds another, fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. 
but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one, and the splendor of earthly bodies is of another. The sun has one splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. And stars differ from one another. So it is in the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is sown, and it is sown in dishonor. What is raised is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last man, Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual, however, was not first, but the natural. So I'll just get back to our little diagram here. So what happens is there is a physical element to our existence prior to coming to know the Lord. But we believe on the Son, and what happens? He imparts the Spirit of God to us. That Spirit inhabits our body, gives us life, and causes us to understand the things that come to us from God. One of those things is this, that we will be given, given a body that is glorified. And that's, to me, that's pretty good, good news because this one ain't doing too good. I can tell you. So, turn with me, if you would, to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. And we're going to talk about the temporary, temporary versus the... Uh, the temporal versus the eternal. Paul writes this, he says, in keeping what, the, what, what is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. We also have the same spirit of faith within us. Therefore we speak, knowing that the one who raised Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is extended to more and more people may overflow in thanksgiving to God, to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though our outer selves are wasting away. Yet our inner self is being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary affliction is producing in us an eternal glory that is far beyond comparison. So we fix not our eyes on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The temporary and the eternal. One existing in a world that is seen and temporary, and the other which is unseen and yet eternal. All this is going somewhere, headed with somewhere with all of this. But I got to tell you, can you just imagine the reality that because we can have this mind shift, this uh, paradigm shift in our thinking, whereby we are seeing things from a spiritual perspective that we begin to see life from a completely different perspective where the things that are unseen actually begin to be that which motivates our and animates our bodies. Yeah. And listen, that's the type of life that you want to have. You want to have a life that is over and above the life that's found in the world, whereby the things in the world cannot harm you. I got to tell you, you can talk about 
flipping through the cell phone in in about thirty in, in about thirty seconds, getting to Russ. When that happens to me, when I'm flipping through that, I, I turn it off and I put that thing aside because these things, no matter what the, how bad they sound, they are temporal. But God, the God that has given this guy life, is eternal. And there's nothing in this world, none of the politics, none of the wars, none of the diseases, nothing found in the in this world that can overcome the life that is found in God. Amen. Right? So that, that's where the thinking has to shift. It has to shift from the temporal to the eternal. And I talk about fulfillment. This is uh, this is uh, from Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. For this very reason, this is Paul praying to God on our behalf. And this is what he says. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I ask that out of the riches of his glory, he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being. I'll read that again. He says, I ask that out of the riches of his glory, he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being, so that you may, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, the, the eternal replacing the temporal. That you, and this is pretty cool now, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, will have power together with all the saints to comprehend the length and the width and the height and the depth of the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure, with all the fullness of God. I gotta tell you something. The world, in its temporal form, in its temporal state, and when I say the world, the people of the world, are striving to find fulfillment. They're try, trying to find fulfillment in everything under the sun. And I'm talking, some of those things can actually be good. You know, family, friends, all of those things can be good. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But true eternal fulfillment is not found in anything in this world. You know, many years back, when I was still a young guy, I went to a doctor. I don't know. It might have been an orthopedic doctor. A, a doctor where uh, traditionally more older people go to. I think it might have been an orth orthopedic doctor. And I go into the, the doctor's office, and I sit down in the waiting room. And it's nothing but a bunch of, like, old people sitting around in the waiting room. And I look around, and I see, and listen, and, and this is not my bad attitude. <laughs> not my bad attitude. I'm looking around in this office at all these old people, and their heads are down. And they... I'm, I'm going to tell you, you could sense the despair in the room. There must have been 15 people in that room. They were all old folks. And I'm looking at the despair. And even then, at that time, I don't know whether I, I had come to know the Lord at the time or whatever it is yet, but I can tell you this. I thought to myself, what must it be like? Because I was a young guy sitting in his room with all these old people. And, and, uh, I looked around and I th thought to myself, how despairing it must be to, to be, to live your whole life. All your friends die off, your spouse dies off, all, everybody you knew is dead, and here you are hanging on with a thread. And think to yourself, is this all life? Is this all that life has for me? 
to lose everybody that I have and not, I'm going to die? Really? I'm telling you, I sense that despair of death in that, in that room. And you know what I told myself back then? And again, I don't know whether it was after I came to know the Lord or after, uh, before. I thought to myself, that ain't going to be me. <laughs> and it ain't, it ain't me. And I'm 70 years old. I'm like one of those guys in that waiting room. And it ain't going to be me. You know why? Listen, okay, my life is not tied to the temporal things in this life. My life is connected to the breath that came down from earth to give life to the world. And when you got that life, you have everything you need. And it's, this is, I just got to say this, this is not like theory. <laughs> this is fact, okay? When you have the life, you have everything you need for life and for godliness. Because the spirit that is of God now is a part of your life. It is who, it is actually who you are. His life is mine. Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. Yet I live, but not I. But it is the spirit of, 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 of Christ who lives in me. This is not a theory. This is a reality. That's why Jesus would tell somebody like Nicodemus, Nicodemus, unless you're born of God, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Because it requires the Spirit to give the, you the light of life. He who has me has the light of life and will never walk in darkness. Now, turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 11, verse 21. Or you can just listen to me. Jesus says this to Martha after Lazarus was uh, had died and he had come. Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know God will give you whatever you ask of him. Your brother will rise again. This is what Jesus tells her. Martha replied, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And Martha said, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Christ, the son of the living God, who is to come into the world. So, in the temporal realm of things, which everybody in the world lives in, it ends with death. <laughs> but those who have their lives, their lives founded in Christ, never die. So that's how he said that. He said, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he be dead, yet shall he live. And he who lives and believes in me, that's like us, he who lives and believes in me will never die. So you got to like ask, your question, ask a question. He who lives and believes in me will never die. So are you going to die? Or are we going to die? Absolutely not. Now, the difference between the temporal and the carnal, uh, the, the carnal and the, and the eternal, is that those who have crossed over into life really actually believe that they're never going to die. Yeah. Those who live in the temporal, they're not so sure. But we know, don't we? Isn't it good? Yeah. It's a good thing to know. Now, anybody got so far, got any thoughts or questions about all this? How man 
kind is and what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God, to uh, ha have been raised from the dead with Christ, seated with him in heavenly realms. So I got my little thing here. So he, he died on the cross, was buried, and was raised from the dead, shedding gifts to men. And so I got this little triangle, kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I got me right there. That's me. And it says, needs fully satisfied. Listen, our needs have been fully satisfied. Now, as we sit here, or as somebody sitting out watching, you know, this video, somebody say, well, you know what? You know what? My, my needs have been fully satisfied. Well, it's kind of like me flipping through the cell phone, okay? We can look around at our circumstances and at times feel as though our needs have not been fully satisfied. But the whole idea of renewing your mind and living by faith is simply this. We have been given life. And in that life, that e eternal, perfect life that he's given us, we have been given perfection. And if we have a perfect life, and we do have a perfect life, even regardless of circumstances, relationships, or anything else, I got a perfect life. And you begin to believe that you got a perfect life. Because it's true. Because we actually do have a perfect life. It's the life of Christ. He is our life. So if we are walking through this life in the knowledge that we have the perfect life and things come to us that cause us concern from time to time, we turn away from that and on to the reality that we have a perfect life. We have eternal life. Our lives, our bodies are going to be raised from the dead yeah. one day. You walk in the knowledge of that reality, that truth, and there is nothing in this world that you cannot deal with. Not to mention the fact that this, this happens. When you have that life, and that life is animating your life, all of a sudden you begin reasoning about the things of this life differently. Yeah. And you can begin to deal with people around you who are struggling that may not have that life. You don't have to beat them over the head with the Bible or tell them you got to believe in Jesus or you're going to go to hell. You, you can begin to relate to these people for who they are. Man, i got to tell you something. I'm, I'm looking at Maslow and reading about Maslow, and I'm, I'm like developing this heart for Maslow, this guy who cared about people and, and is, was only trying to do what was good according to the knowledge that he had. And I'm thinking, man, I like that guy. But you know what we want to do? We want to, oh, when I say that, the religious mind. But by the way, we, so there's the wisdom that's in the world, and there's the wisdom of God, but I tell you, there's a religious mind too. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing but a, a, a variation of the mind that's in the world, okay? And the religious mind wants to deal with things as Maslow thought they could be dealt with. Fixing the things. Fixing things. If we get all of our circumstances lined up, everything that is amiss, if we can get those things straight, we can have the life. And that's what religion does. It basically has us spiritually trying to correct our lives and to make our lives as they should be. But our lives are as they should be, right? Why? Because we got the perfect life. He has given us his life. There is no stain or blemish in the life that he has given us. Yeah. So we can walk by faith in the life that he has given us that life. You see? So it is a perfect life. And when the things come to you, you dismiss them and begin to. It's kind of like the guy who had the speck. He, he was trying to get the speck out of his friend's eye. And the Lord said, listen, get the plank out of your own eye so that you can see to help the guy get the, 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 the speck out of his eye. And that's, that's about what this amounts to. We 
or thinking that we can fix life. We're going to get that plank out of our eye and so that we can see to actually help the people around us. Because what the people around us need is the same life we got. Yep. And you can not only just love these people into the kingdom of God and help them to see that God is love. And and I'm going to, we're going we're gonna to be finishing up really early today because you guys ain't saying nothing. I was waiting for <laughs> hands to raise, and, but we're going to finish early today. But listen to this. You know, getting back, I just want to show you all this one thing back on this side. Something that I really think Maslow actually kind of screwed up. Although I like Maslow. I've got nothing against Maslow. So we got these, these needs. And the highest one is self-actualization. Well, I can really appreciate self-actualization. I, 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 that should be up there. But I got to tell you, love, belong, belonging, self-esteem, oh, these types of things, and in particular, the idea of love. You cannot be self-actualized. Let me put it this way to you. Being self-actualized is being loved by God. That is what being self-actualized is. It is being loved by God and possessing the love that is found in God. Let me sh show you how I can uh, like conclusively prove that to you, make that not just a theory but a fact. Listen to this. Turn with me, if you would, to, matter of fact, I think I'm going to bring it up on my phone here. And it is in John, first, I'm sorry, first John, chapter four. Verse 7. So listen to this. John writes this. Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God. So John is telling the folks, he's encouraging them, love one another. And why is that? Because love comes from God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how we how how God's love has been revealed among us. God sent his one and only Son into the world so that we might live through him. That is how God's love was revealed to us. He sent his one and only Son that we might actually live through him. And love consists of this. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, ought we not love one another? In other words, what it amounts to is, is, is this isn't like some kind of carnal instructions that well, you know, if you love the people around you, things are going to go for you, good for you. That's not what this is. He's saying, if God so loved us, ought it not be natural for us to love those around us? It's an encouragement to us. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God remains in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we remain him and he in us, by the spirit he has given us. So what he's basically saying is, God has given us the spirit of love. And we know that we are of his and he is, is ours because of that spirit which he has given us. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone confesses the Son of God and abides not in him or in his love, he is not of God. And we have come to know and believe that the love of God, 
didn't believe the love of God has for us. For God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God, in God, in him. So what is the identifying mark of knowing the Lord? What is it? It's love. <laughs> because his love is manifest in and through us. That's the identifying mark of who we are. It, ha it, it, it has to do with love. And, and also there in the context, right, those, the, the pe there were people coming and teaching a different message other than God has given us eternal life in this son. Yep. And it connects God loving us with God giving us eternal life in his son. Okay. And these people were coming and telling them eternal life is not godliness, is not found in the son. It's found in something else. Right. And so the way you would love one another is by telling people that God has given you his son, that you might live and not die. That's right. That's how you love, because that's how God loved us. Amen. Right? It's, it's the message. Yep. And you're abiding in God's love if you're abiding in the testimony that he's given you life in his son. That's right. And if you're declaring that to the people around you, you are loving. That's right. Because that's where the love of God is found. Amen. Right? And if you don't abide in that testimony, that God has given us his son and the life that's found in the son, what ends up happening is, is you become filled with hatred, right? Yep. You're hating your brother because you're telling them things that will cause their life to go off into destruction. You're teaching them a different way unto godliness, right? And you're, you're becoming like a thief and a robber, thieves and robbers, because you're teaching them a different way to have life. Right? And, That's right, and God has given us the Spirit, and we're not in need of any other teaching than the truth that's contained in the Spirit. Amen. As Jesus said, that the Spirit is given, and He will guide us into all truth, whatsoever things are revealed in Him. Right? Yep. And so, yes, we can get so caught up in defining love just by the world's way. Oh, yeah. Which really is what we would just call kindness. And we will be kind, because we'll feel so secure that will prefer other people's lives over our own. Sure. But John, for me, you can build out the context to a lot of things. But he's basically declaring the message, right? Here in his love, not that you love God, but that God loves you. That's right. Right? And so you'll be filled with love towards one another if you abide in this truth. If you abide in the testimony he's given in his son. Why will you love your neighbor? Because you'll be telling them the same testimony God told you, which is where love is found. And what is that testimony? What is that testimony? That God has given us eternal life, and this life is found in his son. Yes. He who has a son has life. And 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 I'm going to tell you, knowing that you got that eternal life, is it's almost like intrinsic with the love of God. Yes. Because the love of God is that which gave that life to you. Yes. Not because of deeds that we've done, but because of his graciousness and his love for us. So it, it, it's easy to walk in that love and, and to receive that encouragement that came from John there. That, man, walk in the love because he is love and he, he is your life. And, and that life, in that life, is found love. And, and, and it, it's a good life. But where, where the problem comes with the world and, and with the, the religious world is that many of things are taught some of the same words that I'm sharing with you are shared by the religious world all over the place. But it, it, it is all based on your love and your doing the love of God. And, and when you find yourself in that temporal role, actually trying to produce a love that only God can produce in you by that life, you are going to fail. It, it, is, it, is, it is a temporal love that cannot actually stand the test it's kind of like y'all think peter loved the lord i'm telling you listen in his life before the giving of the spirit peter loved the lord jesus christ he loved him. and then before the rooster crowed three times he cursed and swore, I don't even know that guy. 
the love that is found in this world is vulnerable. It is fleeting. It changes. But the love of God that is found in the life of God, that thing is eternal. And that is the difference between viewing the life from a carnal, temporal perspective and from the reality of truth that is found in Jesus. That love, that life, is your life. And to live by faith is to live believing that that life is your life. Anybody have any thoughts, comments? Now, you know, it's hard to, like, I don't think anybody can refute anything I said because, like I was telling you here, <laughs> the difference between a theology and a truth, it's hard to argue with the truth. It's hard to argue with God. It's hard to argue with God. Listen, when he gave you the life, he gave you the life, and you got the life. Linda says, he who has the son. As love. Ah, that's cool. Yeah. That's so good. What's the greatest form of loving someone's life? It's you want them to live and not die. Yeah. And so the way you would really love someone's life is you would want their life to be preserved. You would yes. want their life to be kept. You would want it to be safe. You would want it to be able to be uh, protected from any harm. And so God come and gave us his life because he knew that would be, was the only thing that could actually protect our life. Listen, in myself, I don't have the strength to protect someone's life. Yeah. I don't have the strength to love someone like God did. But I can partake with God in his love for them by telling them what he's done to give them the life that will protect them from harm. Yeah. And it, it's loving them. And what's the ultimate form of hating someone's life? Serving them with something that can harm their life. That's right. That can destroy their life. The serpent was hating Adam and Eve. And what was the hatred that he had for Adam and Eve? He come and spoke a message to them. That would destroy their life. Yep. That would actually corrupt them. Yep. Right? That's actually how he murdered them. It was through a message that corroded their life. Yep. And so the love of God is founded in him and come and speaking a message that is unto eternal life or life under everlasting. Like you said, a life that even should I die, I'm not really dying dead. I'm still alive. That's right. And it's just, it's beautiful to be able to partake in that and yep. to tell somebody. Yep. And the thing you feel in your heart, you don't preach the gospel because it's a great commission. What ends up happening is you become overwhelmed with God's love for man, meaning that he wants to preserve our lives from death. He wants to protect our lives from harm. He wants to cause our life to overcome destruction. And you get so caught up in how much this guy must love me that he's going to come and pamper me with his life, a life that can't be harmed, that has no spots or blemishes. You become so caught up in that that you feel that you want these people's lives next to you to also be preserved. Absolutely. You want their lives to also be protected. And then you start telling them about God gave his only son. Yes. Because he doesn't want you to perish. Yes. He doesn't want you to die. He gave you came to protect your life, right? And you're feeling that love simultaneously with God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Hey, listen, people want security. They, they have these needs. They, need, they have the need for security, for esteem. Listen. You can be no more esteemed than to be a child of the living God. That's right. Amen. Okay. There's no more is being esteemed beyond that. And listen, that, that's a good place to be. And that's who we are in Christ. Yeah. Let's pray. Well, hold on. Oh, you, Let me stop. oh okay. Go ahead. Pause a second. You just have to stand sure. up there under the light of scrutiny. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, can, I, can I can take it. Yeah. Just give everybody a second to think. Sure. sure. Shelly uh, Venturella says, yep, hatred is putting shackles on people to do works to have life. She says eternal life is eternal love, all consuming love. Amen. And then um, when I scroll back up, I'm gonna read this verse. Oh, you're looking for that, I gotta say. I thought you weren't gonna do number seven. I was like, wait, you gotta do John four. So I was really thankful that you went there. <laughs> oh yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. In Revelation, uh, Bertie wrote, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He says it must be the most profound statement ever. 
Yeah, really. The most yeah. profound statement ever. Yeah. Yeah. Right? He who has the life, like you said, has that. That's right. And they see the way they have this life is on account of God loving them, yeah. caring about their life. Right? And listen, and when Christ, who is our life, returns, we can return with him. That's right. That's a good place to be. Yeah. It's a secure place. Yeah. Or join him in the air. What's that? Or join him in the air. That's right. We're at. That's right. Join him, yeah, if we're, if we're still here. Yeah. And it, it's interesting with man. I think man does a really good job of analyzing the design of human beings. Mm -hmm. And so we could recognize that human beings' design functions this way, and we can externally observe things that we think can help the design of a human being. But what the, what the mind of man can't fathom is how to satisfy those needs, yeah. right? It's like the psychology world. Sure. It's very good at observing a problem yeah. and very good at saying, well, this is how that problem could go away. Mm -hmm. And then if you can't do that, you give them medication. But they never understand the root of the problem. Right. Because like you pointed out so beautifully, not just that, that they're in a, only intellectual, but they're, they're reasoning from a temporal state. Right. They don't understand that the only thing that can actually fulfill man's design and man's whole spirit, soul, and body, their whole being, is eternal. Right? It's an eternal thing. So yep. they're not reasoning from an eternal life when they're thinking of what can solve the problem. They, they can only pick out things they observe in the natural. And so it leaves their, their methodology or their answers or their medicinal attempts um, empty and vain. And temporal, temporal can only produce a temporal result. It, it's just, it, it can't go any beyond that. It, it, their, their method of dealing with things can only be temporal. But God is eternal in his, the way he deals with things and the way he resolves uh, the issue of mankind, mankind, which was death to begin with, is an eternal fix. It is an eternal fix. Yeah, and, and they, they treat the symptoms. Yes. They the, treat the, the symptoms. The wisdom of man treats, treats symptoms. Them. Yes. It can't deal with the heart. Yeah. And so a great picture of that is Jesus on the cross. Right? Yeah. He needed comfort. And he said, I thirst. And man's idea was this dude's suffering. Let's give him an elixir on this sponge that can numb his pain. Right? But Jesus' idea of a solution was not an elixir on that sponge to numb his pain. So he refused it. He, right, because in his mind, no, it's only that which is eternal yep. that can come in and give me the comfort that I need. It's only life eternal that will comfort me in the midst of the suffering of death. Your elixir can't really solve the problem. You see, but that guy was trying to treat the symptom, mm -hmm. right? Because he can see, well, the flesh can feel uncomfortable. Well, let's just, let's just you know, give you an external medicine for that for that suffering. Sure. And Jesus saw, like God, like the wisdom of God, yeah. that was the eternal solution. You know? And the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil has us thinking that we know right from wrong, good from evil. Let me fix this thing. And it, it is it's born of death and is temporal in nature and cannot truly fix mankind's problem, which was death. It was there, there was death in the world. And the reason man thinks carnally is that the death that it sees itself compassed by is striving to make things work, make things right. But where death reigns, things cannot be made right. It's just like the Vladimir Putin thing. Death reigns in this. He's not going to say one day, you know what? Maybe I ought to just start loving the Ukrainians instead of killing them. He's not going to do that. It's because death reigns in this world. And that's why marriages break down. It's why uh, you have interpersonal conflicts at work, at home. Even good marriages have conflict in them. The reason these things exist because death exists in this world. And the remnants of death is it has us evaluating and dealing with things according to the knowledge of good and evil. When God wants to give you the life that has overcome that world and, and, and can cause you to like be a Vladimir Putin who loves everybody. Yeah. Vladimir yeah. Putin 
needs the love of Christ. Yeah. He needs the light. He needs the light. Because he's lusting after life in the world. Yeah. And his idea of life is temporal. Yeah. And he's trying to find immortality in a temporal state. And he's yep. trying to build himself a name in this world. Yep. Lusting after life. Something that's interesting, the temporal thing mm -hmm. that you put up there, mm -hmm. it's real interesting because death, you know, the carnal mind, the carnal mind, one of the attributes of the carnal mind is that it's temporal. Yes. And the reason why it's temporal, and this is an interesting thing, because death is temporal. And it reasons from death instead of life. Mm -hmm. And so all of its solutions are only related to that which is temporal. Mm -hmm. It's confined. It, it cannot ascend outside of that which is temporal. Yes. And so all of its solutions are temporal. And if all the solutions are temporal, those solutions are passing away. Yep. They don't possess the ability to solve the problem. Because it's only an eternal solution that can solve the problem. Yep. And so it's just interesting how the carnal mind can't even comprehend the solution. What's What's interesting about th th this, though, you know, uh, I, I think I just read in one of the scriptures there, how unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. Now, I didn't read that there, but it was something on that order. Well, what happens, and it's, it's just this amazing thing about how God, is capable of saving people who are lost. The fact that even in this state, it can it can bring us to a point of death, on coming to grips with the reality that the temporal is not going to provide me with the life that I need. And, and so he is in the process of every human being revealing through his spirit that this life cannot produce the life that you desire. So what happens? We come to a place of death where we die with him and are raised with him through his resurrection, through, through that resurrection life. So we say, this ain't the answer. Christ is the answer. And then you ent enter into the kingdom of God. Any other thoughts? Yes. What? Can you flip over the chart again? Okay. So yeah. what she said as far as this life cannot produce the life that your heart so desires. So some people, millions of people, would say self-actualization is on the bottom of the pyramid. Yeah. In other words, you have to hit bottom if you're in addiction recovery, to have any chance of self-actualization. So everyone's trying to gain life through these thoughts and imaginations, but it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You, not with your fingers. You come up with, you come up with Maslow's Hakkadis or the exact opposite of that. Yeah. Millions of people believe in. Oh yeah. Uh, but it's vain imaginations. Aside yeah. from the living Christ, you can't gain this life to get what your heart truly desires. That's right. There's no no climbing up the ladder to become self-actualized. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, some rudimentary, weak form, there may be some reality to what we're looking at there. But listen, self-actualization, if you're looking for the epitome of human existence, it's found in being raised from the dead with Christ and knowing that you have his eternal life, his perfect, incorruptible, eternal life. And that is what being, uh, finding yourself in the epitome of uh, human existence. Yeah. Or the self-actualization, and this is how John would say, yeah. in yeah. him was life. And all those who received him, received strength from that life to appear in history as the sons and daughters of God, which is what that word become in the Greek actually means. It means to appear in history. Yep. It said, God said, let there be light, and light appeared in history. And so that's the actual, that's the only self-actualization there is. And it's yep. not, you're not actualized by yourself. What happens is, is God brings you forth for who and what he called you from the beginning, yep. which is his son and his daughter. And the way he does that is he comes and gives you his life as a gift. And to all those who receive his life as a gift, they will be strengthened by his love to appear, set actualized 
as the sons and daughters of God, like as you say, in the resurrection from the dead. And what's interesting about, you know, when you think about how religion deals with people, we think people are bad, yeah. and they got to be fixed, and Christ is going to fix them. Well, i got to tell you, the people in this world, Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Putin, I, I don't know why I'm on Vladimir Putin right now, but I am. He's like okay. your best friend. I, I don't know about that. <laughs> but he, it's like, he doesn't need to be fixed. We think he needs to be fixed. The whole world thinks Vladimir Putin needs to be fixed. He don't need to be fixed. Who he is as a, as a, the essence of his person, apart from behavior, the essence of his person, apart from his behavior, is as it should be. That's how he was created. Not his behavior, I'm, you know, because clearly there's a problem with that. But the essence of it does not need to be changed. There is something inside of him, something that is driving these activities of his that is leading to the deaths of thousands upon thousands of people. And he, in his mind, is justifying it by whatever. But it is that, it is that carnal mind believing that he knows what's right that is causing this to happen. That has to die in a man where a person comes to understand that the life he needs is found in the one who gave us life. He needs life. He needs life. He doesn't need to be fixed. He needs life. That's right. He needs yep. life. And, and Glenn, to your point, that people will flip yeah. that chart and put the self-actualization at the bottom. It, that's exactly right, because they're tracking with maybe even a little better than the Maslow guy, because yep. they realize everything would come forth from having the self-actualization, right? And they're stealing that from the gospel, yes. which is to all those who receive the life appear. And then as you appear, all those other things fall into place, right? Yep. But there, there's no, the fact is there's no such thing as self-actualization. Right. That's right. It's God actualized. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. No question. I mean, you become self-actualized in that it's still you that live, but not you, but Christ that lives in you. You see what, what I'm saying? It, it, it's your life that is being uh, enlivened or actualized, but it's not because of anything that is in you. It is all because of the life that is now in you that you are actualized. That's not right. self-actualized, but actualized. Yeah, that life brings you forth. That life brings you forth. Amen. Anyway. All right. That's Thank cool. you. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the reality that you have given us your eternal life. And that life is everything that we need. And we can actually walk in that truth that, that, uh, that your love is, is, uh, has come to us in the person of Jesus and has provided us with everything that we need for life and godliness. And in that life is like fullness of life. And we can, we can live and walk and have move and have our being in that reality. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.